right, welcome to round 15. I'm Rashad Miller here with hey, Zach Hill. We got a good one with Jack, with John Lucas Banu. He's going up against Jerry Thompson. And it looks like we have a steam vent to start it off with Jerry Thompson. Yeah, Jerry taking two from that steam vent. So we look at Spanu's hand, not a particularly fast land. Five lands, Searing Spear, Dreg Mangler. He uh, didn't uh, have a turn one play, played Overgrown Tomb, tapped. So it looks like that two damage, that two life that was paid is so that he, Jerry Thompson can lead off with a Thoughts scour on himself. All right, it looks like Spanu drew Hellrider the previous turn, and now Experiment 1 this turn. Always very awkward turn to play. Experiment 1, that's a brand new Gate Crash card. 1-1, one, one, Evolve, and remove two counters from it to regenerate. Yeah, it was definitely a card that we thought would make a pretty high impact when we were designing it. Originally didn't have the regeneration ability. Uh, it was just a 1-1 one, one Evolve. We wanted to give it a little bit of extra juice uh, to help the, the, the creature decks combat things and, like Supreme Verdict. And speaking of creature decks and creatures, Boros Reckoner, the card of the tournament. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and a card that is very frustrating for Spanu right now. He's got Searing Spear and Dreg Mangler, neither of which is what you particularly want to see when your opponent casts a Boros Reckoner in the third turn of the game. So Spanu was thinking, what third land should I play? And yeah, I mean, th there's not really a lot of profit to playing Dreg Mangler right now if you have to take damage, so, and that's exactly what he thinks too, putting uh, Overgrown Tomb to play tapped. Yep, Overgrown Tomb tapped, leaving two mana up, possibly four as Searing Spear. Just bite the bullet. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, Jerry cannot be too upset nope. about that, though. Basically, it, that was just a two-for-one. Yeah, I mean, Spanu just voluntarily two-for-one himself. I mean, I yep. guess he's worried about anything crazy happening with a Reckoner or any Restoration Angel tricks, but I, I don't... That is awful bold it of Spanu. Is, it, it is interesting. A fourth land for Jerry Thompson and a pass. Could be Restoration Angel? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, like, okay, so you're trying to set up your Drag Mangler. That makes sense to me. But what do you do about Restoration Angel right now? We, we I guess we'll find out. So Experiment 1 is uh, preceding okay. the Direct Mangler. Evolve. And Jerry Thompson says both of those resolve. Finds it. An Evolve counter. So, I, I mean, I, I see what Spawning's plan is. It's basically like, look. I'm going to have to deal Regards. with a Reckoner sooner or later if my hand's going to do anything. I might as well just have him kill a 1-1 so that my Hell Rider and my Dreg Mangler are actually able to do Snap something gotcha. meaningful this game. So do we do have a, a Flash creature come in, but it's not Restoration Angel. It's Snapcaster Mage giving the Searing Spear flashback and getting rid of the Dreg Mangler. Yeah, I mean, a huge Snapcaster for Jerry. Uh, I mean, Spanu down a lot of cards right now. He's got an Experiment 1 and a Hell Rider, but neither of those is, uh, you know, they're going to have to carry the game on their own because Jerry has a full grip of cards. Oh, and another yep. Boros Reckoner. Yep. Uh, uh, attack with the Snapcaster Mage into Boros Reckoner for Jerry Thompson, so that's another bad news look for Spanu. Yeah, and Spanu just drawing another land there. This Hell Rider utterly embarrassing right now. Uh, only one other creature on the ground and just no good attacks whatsoever. And uh, it really hasn't proved, proven itself, you know, that one creature. It's kind of experimental. <laughs> you know, it's like, eh, <laughs> that's so one sure. creature. Yeah, that one creature. So, I mean, I guess he can, he has a few lines right now. He can uh, use Dreg Mangler's scavenge ability to suit up Experiment 1. Dragon Skull Summit comes down. Uh, you know, maybe you just cast Hell Rider and say go. Where his four mana, it might be a Hell Rider, and it looks like it is. Hell Rider, Evolve Trigger. And I think you just pass the turn and try and set up uh, Dreg Mangler. He's like looking at his hand, deciding about an attack, but I think now is exactly the time that you don't want to attack. Yeah, I mean, he's just flicking between two land cards, and he really doesn't want to attack and lose what creatures he has. He doesn't have anything yeah. else in his hand. The first strike ability uh, from Boros Reckoner kind of coming up there, uh, you know, if if Jerry doesn't want to take the trade, he can just kind of eat one of Spawning's creatures exactly. for Spawning to attack. Jerry picked up a Argar Bolas from his draw step, and now he's deciding how to sequence his turn. I think what you're going to want to do is cast Augur right now and just uh, try and draw into something else. I mean, it, you know, you're you can attack with Reckoner, you're probably not going to. You're not going to Revelation for one. And there's an Argur just like you suspected, but it whiffs. And we have yep. another two mana left, and he's just going to pass the time. Yeah. Uh, 
I think you're going to want to eventually just cantrip with that Azorius charm and flash it back later with the Snapcaster Mage just a, to get going. A somewhere. third land in Spanu's hand. It was a mountain, so still no action in hand. You think he's going to do anything with the creatures he has on board? I think he's probably going to scavenge that Dreg Mangler uh, just because there's not a lot else he can do. Um, you know, it. it Pro at that point, you're either your Hellrider or your Experiment One can one for one with the Reckoner. Um, not an exciting play, and, and of course you're asking to get blown out by Azorius Charm, but I mean, just passing the turn against the Sphinx's Revelation deck doesn't get me excited either. And there's five mana for the Scavenge ability from the Dragmanger. That's going to put three plus one plus one counters, and he targeted Experiment One. So that Experiment One is up to one, one two, three, four, five, six, six. Does Jerry just take the damage? Looks like there's an attack, and uh, oh, it looks no. like we're blocking. Oh, okay. They're correcting his life total, I guess, is what happened. Jerry, uh, Jerry even if he wants to cast Azorius Charma close, is going to block first just to see if he can generate any more advantage from Spanu uh, and get him to commit to anything, some kind of trick, or maybe regenerating the uh, experiment one. Exactly. He, Spanu does have Azorius one charms. mana open, and... That one mana doesn't represent a lot of cards from a Jun deck, but is there anything that it could rep represent? Hmm, uh, maybe like a Tragic Slip or something? I, uh, uh, yeah, really not a lot meaningful that uh, Jerry could be playing around right here. So Jerry yeah, deciding. he's just like, okay, I'm not going to worry about it. Just yep. charm that guy. Azorius Charm is going to put the Spearmint one on top of Spanu's deck. You know, Rashad, a lot of the time, putting something on top of the deck, you're like, oh, I wish I could just kill the creature. But you can't be too upset for your opponent to be drawing Experiment 1 on, like, turn a, 7 a of this A 1-1 Experiment 1. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. So Jerry Thompson picked up a cliff top retreat. Yeah, this may be one of those times where, oh, okay, we're seeing a Snapcaster Mage. Mortars. Main phase Snapcaster Mage is going to give the... Mizium Mortars flashback, and that's going to get rid of the Hell Rider and an attack with both of, <laughs> with all of Jerry Thompson's creatures. It's going to bring Spanu down to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yeah. 12. And Jerry just playing aggro right now. Uh, this game's going to be over in a couple of attack steps. Spanu really needs a big one off the top. I mean, right. maybe Sp I mean, Spanu, we, we already knew what Spanu had off, off the, on the top of his right. deck this turn, which right. is the Experiment 1, which does come down. The Monza's Goblin Raider uh, not looking too threatening right now. And Spawnu trades a, with a Snapcaster Mage. It's about all he's going to be able to hope for. But he doesn't oh, even trade. wow. wow. Azorius Charm puts yeah. Experiment 1 back on top of Spawnu's deck, which means he's going to have yep. another port on Yeah, dead exactly. Draw. And uh, Jerry with two Sphinx's Revelation uh, about to put this one in the bag. He, he doesn't even untap his creatures. He just says they're yeah. attacking again. And that, that, was a, that was a pretty decisive game. Jerry Thompson wins game one. Yeah, Spawnu kept a, a pretty iffy hand right there. I, I don't really like keeping five land hands in my aggro decks, especially like Searing Sphere, a reactive card. Not a card you're really excited to have in your opening hand in this matchup anyway. Dak Faden is the greatest thief in the multiverse. Follow his adventures in the Magic the Gathering comic produced by IDW. A special promo card unique to the IDW comic series comes in each issue. Find out more about these comics at wizards.com slash magic merchandise. So we talked a little bit about Spearmint 1, mostly because it was the most frequently cast creature card in that game. Yeah. Yeah. So we're actually going to get a graphic of, of Experiment once. It's, it's nice to see uh, gate crash cards making an impact on a lot of these uh, very already, um, you know, stable archetypes. And here we go. Experiment one. It has evolved, which means whenever a creature enters the battlefield that has either greater power or greater toughness, you put a plus one, plus one counter on Experiment one. You remove two plus one, plus one counters from Experiment one, and you regenerate it. Yeah, I'm looking at Spanu's deck, a really interesting deck. Uh, Experiment 1 uh, basically gets evolved by almost every creature. Even Deathrite Shaman manages to evolve the experiment. So deck clearly designed with this guy in mind. And again, a, a danger that you're frequently worried about when you know playing an aggressive deck is committing too much to the board, getting hit by a mass removal spell. Experiment 1's regeneration ability, you know, you're going to have to make some sacrifices to use it, but it's going to stay on the table. And when you're playing so many creatures with haste that mm -hmm. this does, you know, Falconrath Aristocrat, Hellrider, uh, 
uh, Flint Hoof Boar right. and Strangle Root Geist, mm -hmm. you can hit for four or five points of damage the very next turn after a Supreme Verdict. So now the playtest name was Darwin. Is that fact or fiction? Uh, <laughs> it, in <laughs> fact, was Darwin, yes. Because he Ch evolves so much. Charles, Charles, not Castle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in fact, the evolutionary biology. Okay, so let's actually get into the meat of the sideboard plans for these two players. So we, you have uh, Jerry Thompson's deck right here, and I don't know. I'm, you know what? This is pretty late in the tournament. This is the pen ultimate round, <laughs> as some might call it. And you'd have to think that Jerry Thompson has at least played against this deck, or has tested against it and has a game plan. If you are Jerry Thompson, what do you think? This, what, what do you think his game plan is going to be? Well, I mean, I think you're actually pretty well positioned anyway. You're sort of pre-sideboarded with the Boros Reckoners. I would add maybe two Oblivion Rings, maybe two Essence Scatters, definitely my Rock's Faith Mender. Um, but there's really not a lot you change. I mean, Counterflux and Rewind are kind of bad. Uh, your one Think Twice can go if it needs to, but by and large, you all your main deck is, is very good against this deck already, so I don't know that you need to mess with too many things. Now, now one of the strategies of sideboard strategies, which I've seen players do mm -hmm. when the situation where okay. your deck is already built to beat the other deck, yeah. is you adjust your deck for how your opponent's going to sideboard. Of course. Now, I don't yeah. know if that's going to happen here, but maybe we'll see some cards, because game, the game's actually going, and we actually have a Steam Vents versus a Tapped Rootbound Crack. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, ETB tapped land on the first turn, probably again not where you want your aggro deck to be, uh, but yeah, we're, we're trying to get a hold of their hands right now. Jerry playing his Steam Vents untapped for Thought Scour's sake. Um, and, and there and is an experiment one from Mr. Spanu. Yeah, and Jerry. There's, yep, there's, Steam, th uh, there's a Thought Scour that we saw. Similar to game one. Right, yeah. The game is playing out very similarly. Again, that second turn experiment one, just not exactly where you want to be. This is the downside of playing all these three color decks. You know, the man in the format by and large is pretty good, but you do get some draws where, like, you don't have a Ravnica land turn one, and uh, it's just awkward. You're, you just slow down by an entire turn, and you're not necessarily able to recover from that. Arger Abolas for Jerry Thompson, and it looks like he hits a Mizium Mortis, which has been a big card in other games. And we actually saw it play an impact <coughs> on this game that we saw, you know, last turn, last, um, last game. So we're finally getting a look at Spanu's hand. Uh, Flint of Boar, Strangle Root Geist, Double Searing Spear. I'm actually pretty surprised, frankly, that Searing Spear remains in the deck. It, it has. It's Basically, three. no good targets against Jerry. Your face? I guess. I mean, I, I'm not really excited to play bad Lava Spike. <laughs> so Flint Hoof Boar comes down. Okay. It evolves the Experiment 1. And it also gains haste because there's an extra red mana. And there's an attack, and Jerry goes down to 16. And like, I, I mean, if you're Jerry here, do you just jam Boros Reckoner? Do you bother with Mizium Mortars? I mean, Jerry has a lot of options right now, and they all seem, frankly, very good. Uh, <laughs> It's a good position Jerry Thompson's in. He's looking at a Boros Reckoner, which could play defense on, you know, either trade with the Flint Hoof Boar or effectively block the Experiment 1 if it doesn't evolve. He also has the Mizium Order that we saw him pick up from the Augur Bolas, which can just kill one of those two creatures. Exactly. I mean, you know, Spanu has two Abrupt Decays. Jerry may think he has one or two more removal spells than that, but... Uh, and yeah. there's the Miz Mizium Mortars. It's going to take out the Flint Hoof Boar. Yeah, and then Jerry saving two life on the Sacred Foundry, setting up a big Boros Reckoner next turn. So Spanu's looking at that Searing Spear, which you're still finding questionable. And he has an Abrupt Decay, but he uses a Searing Spear to get rid of the Augur of Bolas. Yeah. And I'm just not excited to be Searing Spearing Augurs of Bolas. You know what I mean? It allows the experiment, to, the experiment one to get through, and that brings Jerry Thompson down to 11 life. That is true. And Jerry, Jerry is at 11. Uh, he's, he's only got three lands. He doesn't want to commit a, uh, a uh, Reckoner to the board because uh, he's actually in kind of bad shape if, if Spanu had a removal spell there. So he's just kind of opting to say go and see what happens. Yep, Spanu plays a Blood Crypt untapped, or I think it was Blood Crypt untapped. And there is a Strangle Root Geist, I believe. A nice full art Strangle Root Geist. <laughs> Yeah, and Spanu does have the Abrupt Decay were Jerry to cast the Reckoner. Strangle Root Geist, Spanu actually holding another Strangle Root Geist, but just the mana base not really allowing him to cast it. The mana bases are good, but not GG, GG good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so end with the Strangle Root Geist and the Experiment 1. Is that some GG's live for you, Rashad? Yeah, 
that's, that's a lot of G's, and we are live. So. <laughs> Is that what that was named after? It, 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 yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine any other explanation. So Jerry Thompson has a selection of two cast and cost instants that he could use to interact with this attack. Which one's the best? I think you want a Searing Spear Experiment one right now before it gets any bigger. I guess he's Snapcaster Maging a Thought Scour. To oh, th this is just a better play than whatever it was I just said. <laughs> You're, yeah, by a lot. You're Snapcaster Maging your Thought Scour to try and find yourself some more lands and throwing yep. Snapcaster Mage in front of uh, Experiment one as soon as you possibly can. And, and there's a Searing Spear to which found yet another target in this match. Yeah, and, and it, right, uh, you're targeting Snapcaster, and it looks like, okay, I'm forcing through damage, but that Searing Spear was good for three damage anyway, so you're kind of trading three damage for two damage in a card. But again, you do what you need to do. So Jerry Thompson picks up a, his fourth land in the form of Hollowed Fountain. Uh, the, the, the kind of beating for Jerry is uh, it is his fourth land, but he needs to play it untapped to represent both Spear and Azorius Charm or alternatively Restoration Angel, and, and that is going to put him in a precarious life total. Yep, and that's what he does. He's down to five life. Not really where you want to be against a deck that obviously still has his four Siren Spears in it. This is a huge Hell Rider for Spawnio, potentially. I mean, uh, Jerry happens to have the Searing Spear, but uh, he's also representing a potentially lethal attack if that's what he chooses to commit right. to. Right. And Spawnu also has the option of playing two spells out of his hand if you'd like. Right, exactly. But he, he goes with the Hell Rider. Four mana Hell Rider. This is going to. This is lethal if there's no interaction from Cherry Thompson. Yeah, and Jerry's actually got to be pretty excited about that because now he can Azorius Charm Experiment 1 if he wants to and give uh, Spawnu a kind of awkward Three. draw next turn. Yep, so Experiment 1 goes back to the top of the deck <coughs> yep. where it's been nope. many, many times Right. this match. You know, all Jerry wants to do right now is draw some land. That is actually the only thing that he cares about. Uh, pretty pretty dangerous situation still, though. He's just not in a position where he can tap out for either of those Reckoners because of the Abrupt Decay. Exactly. I have to feel like he's going to want to try and set up Restoration Angel this turn. but uh, Now, he did draw a land. He drew a Sacred Foundry, but he's going to have to play that untapped if he wants to have sure. the mana to do the things that he wants to do. And he plays exactly. a tap. He's at three life. It's not really, he's not in the position to pay two more life. For sure. And Jerry representing uh, Restoration Angel pretty hard. I think if you're Spawnu right now, you just cast Strangle Root Geist and attack with your guys and say, all right, you're at one. Um, not only does that almost kill Jerry in a very uh, relevant way, it prevents him from playing any Ravnica lands untapped. Exactly. That's actually a very good point. Now, he did also draw that experiment one. Do you think he wants to play that first to maximize on the Evolve, or is or should he just smell blood and just uh, go for it? I mean, the issue is he only has two green mana. So I, I think he... Uh, I, I think he wants to just get in damage as soon as he can right now. So there's still some consideration, and while the players are thinking we have a score update, Melissa DeTora is up one game to zero over David Shields. All right, you see Spanu uh, thinking in his head the exact same conversation you and I are having. Uh, about uh, the Melissa DeTora David Shields match? Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, actually. He's not thinking about his current game. <laughs> so we, he goes with the experiment one. And uh, a convenient interaction if uh, if Jerry blocks here, which he will. Experiment one gets another counter. Very uh, interesting. So yeah. the <clears throat> the Stranger Rugite does get blocked. It has Undying, so it comes in back to the battlefield, and it does evolve the experiment one. Oh, now this is interesting here. Uh Supreme Verdict, uh, pretty unfortunately positioned right now. Uh, you don't really want to lose your angel, and Spanu has a lot of haste creatures in his deck, so... I think Jerry is going to just look for an opening into where he can get a Boros Reckoner on the table. Um, now, Jerry does have Sphinx's Revelation in his hand. Now, he can only play it for two, but is two life and two cards a, a pretty big deal? Well, that yeah, I, I think you're right, Rashad. That's the line he took. I guess I was expecting a Reckoner, but uh, Revelation for two right now, Jerry needs more lands to turn on his extra Revelation, and the two life right now is a whole attack step. So I, I guess, Jerry, you know, Revelation, you're not usually looking to cast it for just two, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do, you know? So Spanu plays his second Strangle Root Geist. So he's in with two Strangle Root Geist. One has a plus one, plus one counter on it, and an Experiment one, which is a 2-2. Two -two. Now, you're not really excited here to be tapping out for Sphinx's Revelation because you're in Searing Spear range, but if you've seen two Searing Spears already, you can kind of safely assume that Spanu doesn't have it. And is Jerry really in a situation where he can assume that he, he really has to assume Walker. that he just doesn't have it. Can yeah. he really beat it Searing no. Spear right now? No, there's absolutely no way. You just kind of have to cast this and, and see what happens. So, so there is a block. The Restoration Angel blocks the bigger of the 
um, Stranger Woo guys. And there is this, the Sphinx's Revelation 4-2. Two. two cards plus two life. That's going to keep Jerry Thompson alive. He's going to go down. He's going to go up to five. He's going to take four and go down to one. A pretty precarious situation for Jerry still. You know, one life is not a lot of life. Nope. All right, one life. What can Jerry Thompson do? He has another land, a, a cliff trap retreat. So that comes into play untapped. And he has another Sphinx's Revelation in his hand. So is three cards and three life enough to keep him in this game? I don't think that's what you want to do. It's very possible that it is. I think you want to get that Faith Mender on the board right now, along with maybe an Augur of Bolas. And uh, that way, when you that sets up, you know, you, you have a turn window where you're kind of vulnerable, but it sets up your ability to cast the Sphinx's Revelation that really does truly put the game away. Okay. So we start off with an Augur of Bolas, and it whiffs, and there is the, the Rocks and Wraith Faith Mender. Right. Which is a 1-5 with lifelink, and whenever you gain life, instead you gain 2 life. Right. Seems fair. <laughs> it's very good against aggressive uh, red-based aggro decks. I know that much. So Spano's still sitting with the Abrupt Decay in his hand. It can't take out the Faith Mender. It can't take out the Restoration Angel. But it can't take out the, you know, the Augur of Boas. Well, I think he drew a, skull, a skull crack that's going to be game. Jerry's tapped out in it one life. Oh, so that wow. was a huge skull top crack. deck for Spano right I, now. I am so glad I drafted that in my fantasy rotisserie that we did. That was your instant? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> so uh, Spano wins game one over Jerry Thompson. That was a real back and forth game. You know, Spanu really looked like he was in control for most of that match. But if Jerry got even one more untapped phase, I think he was going to be able to put the game away. Yeah. So a uh, pretty huge top deck for Spanu there with that skull crack. Just applied a little too much pressure for Jerry to overcome oh, given his lack of mana. Yeah, that's, uh, that skull crack was out of the sideboard. And we didn't get a chance to look at the sideboard. But we're going to talk about his just in a second. Because we'd like to thank Gaming Etc. for being an official card retailer here at Pro Tour Gate Crash. Gaming Etc. is one of the premier destinations on the internet for all things magic. For more information, visit GamingEtc.com. So back to Skull Crack. What I believe to be, well, I'm not going to say that. Because if I had first pick in that <laughs> draft, maybe I wouldn't have picked Skull Crack. I probably would have picked Spe uh, Searing Spear. But uh, Skull Crack still a great instant in this format. It's you know, it's going to be in a lot of sideboards. And it's not just for, you know, it, it, it prevents damage, but it kills you. It kills your opponent, yeah, too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I it makes a little more sense as to why to have... Uh, Searing Spear, if if we want to, um, maybe maybe Spawner's plan is to just burn you out. I mean, you were saying, you know, Searing Spear goes to the dome, deals three damage. Um, it also hits, you know, Jerry's creatures, sort of, but you're just not terribly excited to cast it targeting any of Jerry's creatures. So I, I feel like you'd take out Searing Spear's four skull cracks, but that doesn't look that's what uh, Spawner's plan is. Yeah, so we're actually going to take a look at skull crack, and there you have it. Players can't game life this turn. Damage can't be prevented this turn. Skullcrack deals three damage to target player. So, uh, you know, that that's a lot of things. Usually when you have a red spell, the, the, the damage dealing part is way at the top. Right. You, you have to read through all this other stuff. It's almost as if you all put it in order so that you have to that you recognize that there's other things going on with this card. Well, the reason that we uh, put the damage at the end is so that people didn't get confused and think that if for some reason the damage uh, was, you know, dealt with or prevented or something like that, that, you know, the rest of the things wouldn't work. The mm -hmm. idea that, like, oh, well, it de you know, people just assume things are conditional when they aren't necessarily. So we put them like that on the card. So you're like, all right, people can't gain life. Got it. Damage can't be prevented. Got it. Okay, now this three damage happens, and we've already established that you can't gain life or prevent the damage. So we, I, I know what to do with that damage. It, exactly. Now, are there any other cards in... Uh, Spano's sideboard that you think he might have brought in for this matchup? Well, we saw the Abrupt Decay. Very, very, very important against the Boros Reckoners. Um, and besides that, I, I don't think there's anything else you want. You don't want too many reactive cards in a matchup like this. Right, okay. so both players are looking at the hand. Looks like they both keep. And we have a Steam Fence tap this time. I think that's a Sulfur Falls. Is that Sulfur Falls? might be a Steam Fence. Yeah, it's a little uh, bit of glare. Can't quite tell what the card is, but Either way, it came in play tap. And there is a experiment one for Jingluka Spanu. And uh, he has it on turn one this time. Uh, which as, is... as you should. <laughs> plan A. We've, we finally found a plan A game here. 
experiment one on turn one, and uh, Jerry yeah. says enough of that. Let's cast mortars and not have to worry about all this business. All right, so a second land for Spanu. Not sure what it's going to be yet, but got a feeling he's going to play something. And it's going to be a Blood Crypt tapped. And again, I just I do not like this Searing Sphere here. If that was like any two-mana creature that is worth playing, you'd just be so much more excited. But we see him draw a, I believe that he, he is drew a, a Flint Hoof Boar. Yep, Flint Hoof Boar. So now with this third mana, with the red being available, he's going to be able to cast Flint Hoof Boar. It's going yes. to be 3-3, uh, three, three, and he's going to be okay. able to give a haste. Top. Yeah, and Jerry just immediately is like, okay, I'm going to Azorius Charm that. Right. I Azor just need some time. Azorius Charm yeah. has been very good for Jerry Thompson yeah. this, game, this match. That is absolutely right. Looks like we got a, well, it's the same Flint Hoof Boar. I was like, oh, he drew another one. <laughs> oh, he drew the same one. So the same play, do you think we have it? Does um, Spinal have a better play? I think he does. I think you want to cast that Aristocrat. Uh, running out Flint of Boar is just asking to get gotten by a Restoration Angel right okay. here. Okay. I mean, I think if you uh, Falconrath Aristocrat, Jerry's going to Snapcaster Mage the Azorius Charm, um, setting up eventually Restoration Angel on Snapcaster Mage on... Oh. Uh, the Mizium Mortars that remain. So Jerry's still generating a lot of advantage. Yeah, this was interesting. Looks like Spano just went with the, the Flint Hoof Boar, not giving it haste and leaving it back and passing the turn. Right. He's setting up, I believe, the Falconrath Aristocrat next turn, allowing him to trade the Flint Hoof Boar for the Restoration yep. Angel uh, if he attacks with the Aristocrat into Restoration Angel. Right. So, and now a Hell Rider was just drawn for Spano. Yeah, good discipline by Spanu there. Uh, just recognizing that Restoration Angel is something you need to deal with, but not at the cost of developing your board. You know, just because a creature has haste doesn't mean that you have to attack the turn it comes into play. Exactly. So four mana is going to be one of these four cast across hasty creatures. Which one will it be? Well, it looks like he's still flipping a coin in his head, and it's Falconrath Aristocrat. Right. And I think you're, Jerry is going to want to Snapcaster Mage Azorius Charm here just to set up Restoration Angel next turn. I think he's probably going to Azorius Charm the Flint Hoof Boar with Snapcaster Mage. Well, Jerry's thinking about something, so he's either going to do that, or you think he's considering Restoration Angel and then just either trade with the Aristocrat? Or Actually, yeah, I'm dumb. I think you just Restoration Angel and block Flint Hoof Boar here. I was not expecting the Flint Hoof Boar to attack. Yeah, it's, it's actually way better to just cast Angel and eat the boar right away. And that's exactly what happened. Restoration Angel comes down thanks to Flash. It blocks the Flint Hoof Boar. And Spano just plays a tapped Overgrown to him and passes the turn. Yeah, I'm really surprised given Spano's discipline last turn that he attacked with Restoration Angel. It's like, if you think that he has Restoration Angel, why didn't, you know, either you don't think he has it and you attack last turn, or you do think he has it, and, and you, you don't attack this turn. Exactly. So I guess that's why I was confused, and, but uh, anyway, he had it. Yeah, <laughs> speaking of attacking, the Restoration Angel gets in. The Snapcaster Mage comes down, gives the Mizium Orders flashback, and takes out the Falconrath Aristocrat. Yeah, and, and now we're again seeing a, a very loose Searing Spear and a, a kind of ineffective Hell Rider being the only creature on the battlefield. I mean, Spawn is going to play Hell Rider and attack it and deal Jerry four, but it's not exactly the most effective when it's the only creature on the board. And uh, Thompson has an Oblivion Ring that can hit the Hell Rider on his turn, and uh, Jerry can start getting in for five with Angel and Snapcaster. Right, so Spawn only has two spells in his hand. He has a couple of land. Uh, maybe he's drawn a lot of land, maybe not, but uh, looks like he's going to tap four and bring down the Hell Rider. Yep, and that's exactly what, uh, that's exactly what he does. Yep, Hell Rider comes down, attacks, assuming there's a trigger going on the stack. So Jerry Thompson goes <laughs> to 15, and Jerry just takes it. He's going to take three more. He's going to go down to 13. And like, you could do worse than deal four damage on this attack for sure. I mean, the Hell Rider is not, the end, not just the most terrible thing that has ever been, but... Uh, Still just not exactly the place Spanu wants to be right now. So Spanu plays a stomping grounds untapped, representing Searing Sphere. Right. Uh, you know, that's what he's representing. I still think if you're Jerry, you got to battle and say, all right, yep. Searing Sphere me, bro. All right, so attack with the Restoration Angel and the Snapcaster Mage. That's going to bring Spanu down to 10. So I think if you're Jerry, you Oblivion Ring that Hell Rider before you have to worry about it anymore. Jerry has an Oblivion Ring and a Snapcaster Mage. So there's a Cliff Top Retreat. Two cards? Two. Ask how many cards you have. Yep. Two cards and pass the turn. I guess Snapcaster Mage onto Azorius Charm is an option. I suppose so, yeah. I, uh. Okay. Huh. 
up. Take one, oh, so he takes one from the Hellrider. And there's Snapcaster Mage. So he's Snapcastering, taking Sorry, one, strong. putting oh. Hellrider back on Jerry uh, on Spanu's deck. I guess he's pretty confident. He, he wants to know what Spanu is going to draw one. next turn and get an additional two points of power on the board so he can attack Spanu down to. Uh, down to three, or alternatively leave Restoration Angel back while still clocking Spanu. So I can understand that play, and uh, you know, he's got an Oblivion Ring too. Um, he maybe he wanted to leave Snapcaster Azorius Charm open for something like Thunder Maw Hellkite. And speaking of Snapcaster Mage, it just bit the dust. It got, it got speared. Another one bites the, the dust. Uh, the, hot, the hot spear, the searing spear kind. <laughs> So that leaves uh, just a couple of land for Spano, and he, we know he's going to draw the Hell Rider. So Jerry Thompson's in pretty good shape, even if he doesn't oh, know it. Oh wow! What a huge Sphinx's revelation for Jerry right there. Attack with both of the creatures. That's going to bring Spano down to five. Sphinx's revelation is just going to yeah. tie this game. It's just going to break the game. Uh, how, how can what can John Luca Spano do to win this game? I mean, theoretically, Skullcrack uh, is very good right here. Um, if he had Sp Skullcrack and something else um, in, in response to Jerry Sphinx's revelation, but, I, you know, I, in, in practice, I, I, don't think he, I don't think he has anything. So if you're Jerry, do you play around Skullcrack? It looks like he doesn't yeah. care right now. It not, and not yep. once Spanu doesn't attack. You know, I mean, I think that what you do if you're Spanu, you, you have two mana open, you can bluff Abrupt Decay if you attack, if you attacked and had Skullcrack and bluffed Abrupt Decay, maybe in theory uh, he could just not draw anything off the Sphinx's Revelation and you could get him next turn with another Skullcrack. I don't know. I mean, I'm speculating yeah, here. It's, it's not it's, an easy game yeah, to it's win. De it's definitely all speculation now. And Jerry Thompson uses the Oblivion Ring fresh off of one of the many cards yeah. he's drawn, and that's just it. Jerry Thompson wins 2-1 over Jean-Luc Espanu. And this is going to put Jerry into the top eight of this event with a draw next round. Jerry's first Pro Tour top eight. Jerry, for a long time, one of the best players in the United States. You can see how happy he is right now. Uh, yeah, and, and we're actually going to get a to get a chance to hear from Jerry Thompson, probably hear about, because this, yeah. this is going to be his first Pro Tour top eight. Right. If he actually, you know, if he makes it in. And this is as close as he's been. Wondering which guild is right for you? Take the guild quiz at guildsofravnica.com and then declare your allegiance on planeswalkerpoints.com to earn badges and achievements. So I was thinking that, um, you know, I've been playing green. I've been a green mage for all of my life. Yeah. I'm thinking maybe I should switch over from green to some other color. Convince me to be Rakdos. Convince you to be Rakdos? Com we have the most fun, man. Do you? I we mean, don't have to worry about these ideals, anything like that. We just do what we want. It's but, awesome. But you know what? I, I, like to have, I like to have my green fun in the forest and play. You know what? En enough of us trying to figure out what gills we really should be. Let's toss it back down to the floor. We're going to hear from Tim and Jerry Thompson. Hello, I'm Tim Willoughby here with Jerry Thompson. He's just won his match to now go X3 on the day. A great spot to be in, Jerry. I think that's the magic number. Hopefully I can draw into top eight. And 33 Pro Tours, uh, until recently, held the ignominious uh, uh, honor of being the person with the most Pro Points and no Pro Tours of eight. How does it feel right now? Uh, it, it feels pretty good. A little surreal, I think. Nice to be in a position to perhaps have to just have a little sleep on a Saturday night? Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's fine. Um, so, I mean, how did that match go? Was, was it tenser because it's this much closer, or is it just a, another game of Magic? Uh, it, was, it was a little tenser. Like, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't. You know, I, I do my best to make it all just be the same or whatever, but this is a, a huge match for me, so. A big deal, a big win here for Jerry Thompson. He's got one round to go, but on the record he's in, he's in a great shot to be in top eight here at Pro Tour Gatecrash. Heading back to the booth now. Thanks, Tim. You know what? I've been watching Jerry play for a long time. I've been watching him play for a long time. You know, we've been going to GP's Pro Tour qualifiers yeah. together. You know, this guy, he's a great Magic player. And you see him get um, be so successful even in other, you know, independent Magic right. uh, circuits. And he comes to the Pro Tour, he doesn't do so well. Right. But, you know, he's got all this tally. He's got all the, the numbers are there. And I, I love the fact that he's he's finally going to do it. Well, I mean, I've been battling with Jerry Thompson decks in PTQ since, like, 2002. But yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I didn't battle with those decks. I always made some weird green deck. And, and <laughs> just, I was just ready for it. 
So uh, just a quick update on what's going on in the other tables. Uh, we have, I, I believe we have Joe Larson and Stephen Mann. Man, they're tied at uh, okay. one apiece. Mr. Dottore currently leads one game to zero over Dave Shields. And I believe Tom Martell and Robert Gonzalez, they're tied at one apiece I as think well. so, and I think that's the match we're about to take a look at so, right and, now. So, and that's the match we're actually going to go down to. We're going to be watching Tom Martel versus Ro Roberto Gonzalez. Nice bow tie. I was going to say, both. Roberto looking fly right now. Very, Tom. very stylish. Trying to be more stylish than, than I was going to say, us. is he wow. taking a cue from your show? Well, I mean, I, a hat would go great with that <laughs> bow tie. <laughs> that's all I can really say. I mean, that, that goes without saying, honestly. Yeah. So, just a little quick... Um, Game state update. We have Roberto Gonzalez with a Snapcaster Mage and play a bunch of spells in the graveyard. And it looks like he just played a Is It Static Caster to take out a champion of the parish for over on Tom Martell's side. Life totals right now 21 to 7 in favor of Tom Martell. Yeah, I was uh, looking at Tom's board thinking Gonzalez was in the driver's seat. You know, a pretty yeah. big Is It Static Caster. And then, and then there was a trigger. Yeah. <laughs> and then a trigger happened. Obsidot. Ghost Council comes back from hiding. Where, where does he go? Uh, he's a ghost, so you know he just disappears. He's kind of hanging out. They're always around. They just uh, they only show up to the party when something big has to happen. Okay, all right. So when when you know when the party's on your side, he's like, yeah, let's do it. But, oh yeah. But you know he doesn't care what he going has on better things to do. He's not worried about hanging out with you. He's not worried about making you happy. Oh, a huge Falcon Rouse yeah, aristocrat Falcon. right here. And, and I have to imagine that one of those. Cavern of Souls is on Vampire. Yeah. Can only imagine that at least one is. And there is the Falcon Rath Aristocrat. Can only imagine it's also going to attack. Yeah, so he's like boldly battling with Aristocrat, uh, basically saying, I don't care about uh, this ecstatic caster. I just want to get you down sure. to one life. Yep. I'm not really... Oh, okay. He doesn't want to attack with Obsidat because he doesn't want to run it into an Azorius charm. Exactly, because we have it when it, when Obsidat comes back, does it... You lose... Does it make your opponent exactly. lose life? So, and Gonzalez Robert, needs to gain some life right now. Yeah, he needs to do something. He's at one life and just a trigger just waiting to happen to end this game and this match. Yep. And yep. that's exactly what happens. That's it. Congratulations to Tom Martell. He wins 2-0 over Roberto Gonzalez. Tom with the flawless it, victory, yeah, winning at above Perfect. 20 yeah. life. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that an achievement I, uh, that you get on uh, planeswalkerpoints.com? <laughs> it might be. That might be hard to track. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, you have like, so many syncopates, I think it gives me a lot of equity. Right, right, right. Yeah, and that, that's the thing, is that, uh, yeah, cavern is bad for me. Excellent job, though. Proud of you. Sorry, I hate to be against you. Hey. I didn't really mean that. Qualifiers for the next Pro Tour have begun. You could be on the big stage for Pro Tour Dragon Maze taking place May 17th through 19th in San Diego. For more information, visit wizards.com slash ptq. You know, I knew a guy named um, Pete, Peter Quincy. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we called him PDQ. P just uh, unending hits from Rashad <laughs> Miller, right? Between you, you and Rich. You love it. Mine, mine gonna... are better than Rich, though, right? <laughs> they have to be better. Okay. Am I on the record right now? <laughs> no, nope. No record of this at all. Uh -uh. No one's watching. So we got a couple more updates from the back tables. Dave Shields wins 2-1 over Melissa Tora. And I think Joe Larson. No. Oh, the... Dave, Dave Shields and Mr. Torah, they're one apiece. So we're actually going to be able to see the, the third game in its entirety. And I believe Joel Larson and Stephen Mann, they are, they are still 1-1. That's probably going to finish before we get a chance to look at it. And actually, Joel Larson just won 2-1 over Stephen Mann. So. And I can vouch for a shot. Joel Larson won as he was saying the match results. So yes. Right up to date coverage here. The, that, that's as up to date as it gets. And you know what? If you want something almost as up to date, you guys can just join in on Cover It Live okay. because you get to know what's going on in all these other matches because we have, you know, our text guys, they're running out, getting some information, coming back, bringing it back. We have Nick Fong telling you all of the scoop straight from the scorekeeper's table what's going on as the results comes in. You're going to find out 
who's winning all these other matches that we don't have room for in our future match area. Just go to dailymtg.com, click on the link to, for the coverage for Pro Tour Gate Crash, and it's all there. Everything's just there. All you have to do is click on more links, open more windows in your browser. You all have, you know how browsers work, <laughs> right? Just open up more browsers. Guys, use, I don't know where this is going. Just use I more don't. monitors, open more browsers. I'm not have in control every, of Just this. watch it Time. all. Okay, well, <laughs> log on am to I, his am computer. I a little, am, I, am I too enthusiastic about, <laughs> about all these no things, thing, about man. like browsers? You know, I Bro, I am really glad <laughs> <laughs> using Windows 8 or something. Well, things I, I, are just I, I populating. I'm, I'm not on Windows 8 yet. So <laughs> it, it's the next. Actually, I do have a Windows 8 laptop, but it doesn't have a touch screen, so it's almost like I'm not on Windows 8. I just get rid of the whole, the whole. Um, Tiles this is such a good story. I know. This is a great you probably story. don't know anything. You, what I'm talking no about, you're like, yeah, Windows 8, blah, 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 computers, blah, blah, blah. I don't. Blah, that is computers. true. I do not know what a computer is. All right. I've never used one. Let, let's go back to this, man. We got, we, 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 we got Dave <laughs> Shields on the left, well, Melissa Latour on the right. We've, we've been seeing yeah. Melissa Latour all day, but let's look to see what Dave Shields has going on. Now, he's a player that, um, while I was doing some other coverage on other independent Magic series, that he had a, he had a couple of big runs in a lot of those tournaments. And that's how I got to know this player and, and recognize his name. And he is piloting, looks like, a red-white-blue deck. That's exactly right. Uh, it's a deck really similar to a lot of the other decks we've seen. A uh, few innovations. It's got a main deck, Jace Memory Adept, but uh, otherwise it looks a lot like the uh, kind of you know, just red, white, blue, flash tempo decks that we've seen a lot of Snapcaster Mages, Boros Reckoners, Restoration Angels, and a whole lot of instances. I, I, I like to look through the Boros Reckoners red, white, blue decks to see which um, QC combo they're going Yeah, with. exactly. And I don't see one. one. Oh, no, he's got two. Boros Charm, uh, oh, yes, the Azorius double charm. charm. The so, double charm. Yeah, exactly. He can do precious, adorable things. Interestingly, I, I don't see Augur of Bolas in this deck, which is something that we see in basically everything. Yeah, especially in decks like these that have so many instants and sorceries. Now, we did we just mentioned the the double charm combo. Right. And for those who aren't familiar with the way the double charm and uh, Boros Reckoner combo goes, why don't you explain it to the player? Well, okay. I, I tell me if I get this right, okay. uh, because you, know, you are the judge. I'll, I'll tell you if you get the gist of it or if you're just completely off. Okay. So so the deal is, first you want to make your Reckoner indestructible, and that lets him damage itself without going away. Then you want to give your Reckoner lifelink. And then finally, you want to just make your Reckoner take damage somehow. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, you just start having it damage itself, and each time you get that many life. Exactly. That's exactly yes. how it works. I passed. You, you, you did it. And now we have some magic. So we have a couple of tapped land to lead it off, and Melissa Tatora sure. plays the first spell, which is Farseek. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly where you want to be in Melissa's seat. You've got three lands to your opponent's clear board. Uh, you, I mean, you can't really script a better start. Place. She fetches out a Sacred Foundry with that far seek and passes the turn. And Davis Shields is looking at a few land and some blue spells. Let's see if we can get the hands updated. A couple of Snapcaster Mages. Yeah, he drew a Supreme Verdict uh, off the top, which uh, this is one of the awkward things about his deck. His hand was three creatures, promptly drew a Supreme Verdict. Uh, not really the combo that you're looking for. Yeah, not really Go. the interactions that you want to produce. I mean, the cards are in the deck for a reason. They're quite good against, uh, once Melissa gets her creatures going, good against the mid-range deck, and you just have to have some outs once the your opponent has more threats than you. But, exactly. Uh, so a, th a fourth land from Melissa to Tor and Breeding Pool comes with a play tapped, does not have any play on her turn. She passes it back to Dave Shields. And uh, Shields uh, basically, I think, just drew a land there. Um, it has a counter spell. I think it's uh, he's gonna probably just plop a reckoner down on the table and start creating some uh, How creating a clock. Four. That's definitely an option. He also has a he has a couple of snapcaster mages, which probably won't come down without any instants or sorceries in the graveyard to target. So there's the third land, and yep. there's the boros reckoner. It's like you knew. I, like I'm, you know I'm the future. very 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 intelligent. <laughs> I, I don't know how to I, tell you your shot. I, I cannot. Disagree. I, I blow my own mind sometimes. Wow. Which is ironic given how intelligent it is. It's hard for it, it to It seems be blown, like you would just get it. It's it, sort of an unstoppable force and movable object type. Oh, thing. I thought it was more like a loop like Boros Record in a couple <laughs> of charms. <laughs> anyway, we so, see a syncopate from Melissa. Syncopate exiles the Boros Recorder, and there is a Thraktus. Five mana, five three, five life. <laughs> and again, you've you got to be excited as Melissa 
have a Thrag Tusk against an empty board, your opponent's going to probably have to burn a Supreme Verdict and a Searing Spear on it. Uh, yep, Dave not Shields the worst just, situation. just drew the Searing Spear, so Dave Shields does have the amount of cards needed to deal with one Thrag Tusk. That is true. Uh, the the great thing for Melissa in her seat right now is just being able to follow that Thrag Tusk up with a Sphinx's Revelation should Dave ever tap low to deal with the Thrag Tusk. Dave Shields deep in the, th in the tank. Is this oh. Thrag Tusk really that much of an issue for him? It's not right now. I mean, definitely dealing with it is not a huge priority. I mean, you know, he's got four attacks before he has to start worrying about it. Um, the thing is, though, you know, five damage is five damage. Five damage is five damage, and three damage for Searing Spear takes out the Thrag Tusk. It gets replaced by a 3-3 Beast Token. Now, why was that a main phase Searing Spear? Because that's an instant. We can do that on, on Melissa Taurus. Right? That is a great question, Rashad. A thing that you do not want to subscribe to is something that I call instant-itis. <laughs> instant-itis is a very dangerous disease. That's thinking that you have to cast instants on your opponent's turn. The problem is when your opponent's deck has four copies of Restoration Angel. Yes, exactly. That's quite the blowout. And there's a second Thrag Tusk. Now that second Thrag Tusk, not that bad for shields, uh, given that he was planning on Supreme Verdicting this turn anyway. So there's the fourth mana, and there's the Supreme Verdict. So that's going to get rid of both of the creatures that are in play. Cool. But one of those, the Thrag Tusk is going to be replaced by a 3-3 Beast token. Exactly. So Melissa's still out ahead on cards. You know, a Hill Giant, not the biggest threat in a constructed game, but uh, you know, you do what you have to do, and uh, you know, it still attacks for three and blocks for three. I like to think of it as the call of the herd token. So, three, three attacks, and Dave Shield goes down to 14. Melissa, I think, really wanted to land there. Um, she can, you know, burn the Azorius Charm to draw a card if she needs to, but uh, the Sphinx's Revelations, you don't really want to be using a Revelation for just two cards uh, in a matchup where Go. both players are trying to throw giant revelations at each other. Right, but it looks like there is going to be a Sphinx's Revelations for two. Maybe yeah. Mithril Dator really wants to draw land? Well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, is that like you need both land and spells, and you've got a second okay. revelation that's not going to get good until you get some more land. So, so it, it does resolve. Melissa Dator goes up to 32 and goes up to four cards. Is so it okay yeah. if we just don't mention Melissa Dator's life until <laughs> she goes below 20? She has a lot of it. <laughs> 14 to a lot. Now, uh, Dave can set up a Snapcaster oh, on a Searing wow. Spear for that beast basically any time he wants. Uh, it all depends on just how big a hurry he's in. He kind of will want to keep mana up Watch. for Counterflux, though, so uh, I would expect that beast to be eating uh, some of Dave's life total for at least a little while. Exactly, and there is the Snapcaster Mage, and it looks like it's going to be Snapcaster into yep. Searing Spear to get rid of the, the beast token. Thank you. Yep. Up, Dave Shields takes his turn, and he draws a thing twice. Now, I think this is uh, time for the momentum to shift a little bit yep. in Dave's favor. Snap he can, cast, uh, yep, Snap Castle Mage hits the red zone. That's going to bring Miss Latour down to a little less life, or 30. Yep. And I think what Shields is trying to set up is just getting the sixth land so he can cast Reckoner with Counterflux up. And there's the sixth land. Passes the back. Miss Latour draws another land. She drew a couple off of, you know, yep. the draw step and the, right. and the Sphinx's Revelation. So that's going to bring her up to seven mana. So Sphinx's Revelation for four, is that, is that an option? Or are we waiting until we can protect it? Yes. Or are we just going to wait for, are we, are we waiting or are we going? I, it's hard yeah. to tell. I mean, Shields' counterflux can put a stop. It doesn't matter how many counter spells Melissa has. Yeah, right, right. Uh, so uh, I think she just is going to wait a while for a window to cast it. Uh, I think what she wants to do, though, really is just draw more threats. Right. And she's at a healthy 28 life, so this snap cast is just going to take a long time in order for it to be a real threat. Yeah, I mean, she doesn't really care that much 26. about the snap cast yep. mage right now, I have to think. Um, but, I mean, the, the downside is... Sure. Uh, and you see Flashback think twice, leaving three mana up for Counterflux. Melissa playing Temple Garden on tap because she has the life, but she's just not going to be able to force through a Revelation uh, Stop because Cast of Counterflux. Stop Cast the Mage hits the red zone. That's going to bring Melissa to Tora down to 24. And Dave Shields picked up another Boros Reckoner. Is it, is it time to start the Reckoning? <laughs> Magic the Reckoning. <laughs> I think it might be. I mean, y you want to have more of a clock than a Snapcaster Mage right now. That is for sure. So three mana, and it looks like it could be. There it is, Boros Reckoner. So and what does Melissa sure. Tutorial yep. think of this card? I mean, I, I think you're, you're looking at an Azorius Charm. You don't care about it that much. You've got a Restoration Angel. Um, 
that you're just going to race with, right? I mean, you can trade three for five damage when your opponent's at 11 life and you're at 24. Right. So Dave Shields is still thinking about this Restoration Angel. I have to think that, is, is this just posturing, or is there an actual consideration of the Restoration Angel being a significant threat with Dave Shields at 11 life? I mean, I, I, yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think countering it here is very, very wrong, because, well, I, I mean, maybe not. I, Dave has seen it's, it's uh, okay. spaces. It's okay to, to think things. No, so, right? Yeah, yeah. I, you look, I'm not playing at this uh, at this table right here, but I, I mean, Dave has seen the Sphinx's revelation go by, and Melissa use it for two. On one end, that might make you think, okay, well, uh, she's used her Sphinx's revelation. On the other end, you're not going to burn your only Sphinx's revelation for two unless you have to. I feel like this is a prime opportunity for Melissa to tap out and revelation for a huge amount of cards. Now there is one blue mana open. It's that that could be representing a dispel it could absolutely be a dispel but i think at this point you're not going to be able to play around dispel and you just have to kind of own what's about to happen now this is interesting because this is a sphinx's revelation for four leaving open a hollowed fountain i think uh melissa is just looking to draw a land and be able to represent the gate for the opposing sphinx's revelation and it looks like she did draw a land in sun petal grove and she now has mana open for negate I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you got to get rid of the Restoration Angel, and you're at 11 life, so, I mean, you have to do something about it, but I, I feel like, no, I don't know. Well, Boils of Reckoner and Snap Custom Mage gets in for 5 damage. That's going to bring Melissa to Torrent down to 23. Yeah, and, and Melissa still has to do something about these creatures. I mean, she has the Supreme Verdict, which she drew off the Revelation, but uh, this is by, by no means Shield's only wave of creatures. And there is a Supreme Verdict. That's going to destroy all of the creatures in play, and David Shield was the only one with creatures, so now the board is clear. Melissa to Torrent is probably feeling yeah. a little bit better. That's true. Uh, Shields, again, has some time now. I mean, uh, he's going to be able to Snapcaster Counterflux on the rest Restoration right. Angel and keep the pressure up. Uh, Detora really just kind of a bunch of answers. So both players in draw go mode. Um, Shields didn't play the Boros Ruckner. He has a lot of mana. Why do you think he's holding back? I think he just wants to keep open nope. the uh, the Snapcasters. Um, I mean, there's there's Counterflux, but the, I mean he can also get a charm if he needs to. I also just think that. Uh, he, he, there's just no reason to commit a Reckoner to the board right now. Okay, so a Restoration Angel comes down from Melissa to Tora at the end of Dave Shield's turn. I assume, I think we're still in Dave Shield's turn. Yes, we are. And now there's two mana and a Snapcaster Mage is going to come down and give something flashback. Possibly That's Counterflux? Yeah, I think it's going to be counterflux. And again, like you know, your opponent has supreme verdict in their deck, so why, you might as well just make them deal with your snapcaster mage as opposed to committing multiple threats to the table and saying, "All right, uh, I'm just going to walk into a supreme verdict." Right. Melissa Tori uses the two mana left open for Azorius Charm to draw a card. Goes to a turn, plays a breeding pool, tapped, and passes right back. So Melissa sort of out of gas right now. On the other hand, she has a lot of answers 21. should Shields play a substantial threat. And, I mean, uh, not really under a ton of pressure, still healthily above I mean, 20 three, life. I have uh, the attack four. with the Snapcaster Mage is going to bring her closer to 20, down to 21, still above 20, still very healthy, still a ways away from the Snapcaster Mage beatdown win. Now, uh, Shields still has two Snapcaster Mages. Um, not going to be able to force through a Sphinx's Revelation, uh, but... Okay. There's a Boros Reckoner. We see now, finally, it's like, okay, I've got enough extra mana and a couple more Snapcasters that even if I get uh, the Supreme Verdict, and I, I have more pressure that I can apply. Now, do you think that there was some, as Dissipate counters the Boros Reckoner, or attempts to, is at least targeted for the moment, do you think that there was some consideration from Dave Shields, since he has such a low life total, to be less aggressive with that Boros Reckoner? Because it seemed like he had a couple of turns where he could have gotten it in, onto the battlefield with plenty of mana open. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he did. Again, I, I just think it was the, the addition of the third Snapcaster that... Uh, he just wanted to be able to go Snapcaster, snap, Snapcaster, Snapcaster, if, if necessary? No, if there was a verdict, he still wanted that have meaningful too. clock. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's make, that makes a lot of sense. I What I don't understand is this Good dissipate on this Boros Reckoner right now. Well, um, I think the understanding is it's going to counter target spell and then exile it if he gets countered. I, that's certainly what it's going to do. <laughs> I just, like... Yeah, I mean, Melissa has one negate uh, for all of, of Shields's well, Shields's revelation. Apparently, it was a very um, it was something that Dave Shields did not want to happen because he used yeah. negate on the dissipate. And there is a detention sphere, which is six spheres, which is going to.
target probably that Boros record. I have to imagine that oh, Melissa Tora isn't finished trying to Go. get that off the board. Six minutes left in this round. These players probably have a have a time extension. We could probably find that out from uh, Tim. Including the time extension, they only have to hit six minutes. Now, I mean, I guess you want to keep Reckoner off the table because of Shields' combos, but, like, you have ways of counterspelling the combo 17. pieces, too. Yep, so we're back to stop casting HP yeah, now. Looks like this the tour is going to be at 19, possibly 17. We may have had two attacks that haven't been updated. So is it Charm Snapcaster Go. Snapcaster a really good hand uh, on the, uh, you know, I think basically the Snapcaster can just sit and attack and uh, Shields is going to say, all right, I'm going to make you do something. Yep, it seems like that's going to be fine for Dave Shields. He's going to use Is It Charm in the draw to discard to mode. He sees a Searing Sphere and a, he has a, a couple of Fortress, I believe. Yep, he has a couple of lands, a Glacial yeah. Fortress and um, a blue-red land of one type or another. But they're both going to go under great. Yeah, and you just don't need any more lands at this point, so. Is the charm actually doing a lot of work there? So there's another 15. attack from Snapcaster Mage, and I believe the Centaur is at 15 and not 21. We can get that updated pretty soon for you guys. Those are very different numbers. They, they are. And there is Sphinx's Revelations for all but there. five mana, which would be one, two, three, four, five. That is a pretty huge revelation for Melissa right here. She's keeping up double counter back up. And she actually does have the two counter spells. There's one dissipate on the Snapcast. Yeah. Mage. And uh, so I, I, we have to expect Shields to play uh, another Snapcaster Mage, uh, and the counter spell will be hit with negate. Now this works out well. Now this is interesting. Um, do you dissipate the Snapcaster Mage, dissipate. or do you dissipate the spell that's going to be flashed back? Dissolves. I think you dissipate the Snapcaster because you can, and because you don't have an answer in your hand right now okay. to the Snapcaster Mage. Mm -hmm. And, like, the last thing you want to do is just, like, okay, die to snap resolution and just die to two Snapcaster Mages, yeah. All right, so yep. the negate comes down, and the negate 20. gets negated. So Sphinx is the revelation for five, does resolve. That's going to bring Melissa to the Torah back up to 20 life. She's going to have five cards in her hand. She's going to attack with a lot of mana. And so we see a Witch Bane Orb right there. That card is uh, to combat Chase Memory Adept. Uh, you see Melissa picking up the pace. Uh, right now pretty excited to have resolved that revelation not a whole lot in her hand still but that think twice can draw her into some goodies so there's uh, the witch bang sure. orb which gives you hex proof Go. but uh more importantly removes all curses yeah, attached more, to you more importantly <laughs> yes yes there there are that for a the, while people were playing that blue curse yeah and we actually saw that blue curse uh, the yep, curse of 16. echoes i actually saw it in the feature match area and uh, which is more, which is a, per is a perfect answer to it. Nope. But right now, it's just going to give Melissa to a head to proof. If someone played Witch Bane Orb against my Flash Curse of Echoes, I would start crying. I don't think you'd cry. I, I, no, it's possible. It's possible. I could go either way. You're stronger than that. <laughs> Sun Petal Grove to add to the plethora of land that Melissa Tatora has. And she has a Detention Sphere and a Azorius Charm. Looks like I'll she's going to draw a card with Azorius Charm, and she draws a Restoration Angel. That is not bad. That is not very bad at all right now. Azorius Charm over for Dave Shields. And he also has a Restoration Angel. That is a pretty big Restoration Angel for Shields. Uh, the, his Restoration Angel, decidedly unlike Melissa's, uh, triggers a Snapcaster and allows him to flash back oh, maybe a yeah. Visit Charm and draw a lot more cards. Restoration Angel. Yeah, we see a Restoration Angel for Melissa, at which point I think Shields is going to cast his own cards Restoration two. Angel yeah, and uh, kind of generate a blowout right now. <laughs> right, so Dave Shields is sure still looking that. at a couple of Serum Spears and a ask. Restoration Angel and a um, Counterflux. Yeah, I think you Restoration Angel yeah, or Snapcaster and try to yeah. cast uh, I don't know, basically well, anything. Wh whatever he does, he's going to do it on Melissa de Torres' turn, okay. obviously. And there's For a sure. Kessick Wolf run, so this... Um, that this is huge. Pow, pow, pow. Pow, 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 pow. David Shields is counting up. Is that more than 11? Because I'm at 11. That's what he's saying. Now we see uh, Melissa with a negate in a detention sphere. Yeah, Dave is trying to, I guess, uh, mind game her into just sort of tapping out for a Kessig Wolf run. Mm, possibly. 
You're definitely dabbing some mana for yeah. Keswick Wolf we're, we're definitely Wolf running at some amount. Probably that Whoa. much down there. Yeah. <laughs> what, whatever that much is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, 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 uh. It might have uh, been eight. Uh, I think I might have. Wolf Runner for it's eight. Kinda, it's Wolf Run for eight. Exaxes? You're not That's... giving me any credit? <laughs> wow. Exaxes. <laughs> <No credit. laughs> He's Jaguar. She's like, yeah, what do you got? I mean, Dave Shields has Restoration Angel, so he has something very relevant. Not only will this, you know, stop him from dying, but he's going to get some value out of one of those Snapcaster mages. Yeah, I mean, hey, Dave has a lot of play right now, a lot of different things he can do. Uh, I guess we're seeing a Restoration Wait, Angel. Wait, didn't you, uh, oh, you, uh, you already didn't block, correct? Okay. Correct. I okay. didn't block. This is, All this, right. this okay. is before this results. Uh, that resolves. All right, target Snapcaster Mage. Yes, that resolves. All right. Target Azurius Charm. I like it. These guys yeah, are doing our work Azurius for us. Charm. Yeah, I was going to say. Ooh, so Azurius Charm is going to get negated and Counterflux counters the gate, so. All right, so that, top. the Restoration Angel goes to top of the yep. Torah's library, so no damage is being dealt and three mana from the Torah. We're All probably right. going to see a detention sphere. Yeah, exactly. Now, that's an interesting thing. Do you target these Snapcaster Mages? Do you target Restoration Angel? Well, I mean, it might, the Restoration Angel seems like a pretty good target now that your Restoration yeah, Angel isn't going to be, isn't going to jump under it as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, I hated school when, you know, someone threw the, the eraser at the teacher and instead of just the person that did it getting in trouble, everyone got in trouble. This is kind of like... This is kind of, it's kind of like eraser throwing. Yeah. I, I see no differences between this and eraser None throwing. None whatsoever. And there is the attention, detention sphere. So getting rid of both the Snapcaster Mages, uh, Melissa is just going to take a little bit less damage and uh, her Restoration Angel gets to have Kessig Wolf run help, unlike Shields is. It does. Now Shields attacks yeah, with his Restoration Angel. That's going to bring Melissa the Torah down to, to 9. I remember when she was at a healthy 34, and now she's getting lower and lower, and there's two, there's two Serious Spheres. Well, there's one Serious Sphere in Dave Shields' hand. I believe he has a missing Mortis as well. And now uh, we know Melissa is going to draw Restoration Angel next turn, so uh, pretty pretty straightforward game from yeah. here. Now, now it's a situation where you just may face it because it's, there's no truth, there's no secrets. I don't I don't think you may face it because your opponent's playing Mizium. Well, that's a, that's a good. Yeah. That is a good point. So we are actually in time. So right now this is turn zero, and there will be five additional turns after the current turn. Now, Melissa, I, you know, the temptation is to try and get aggressive with this Kessig Wolf run. You also have to make sure you don't lose the game. Oh, this is actually turn three, so we've been in turns for a couple of turns. And Shields uh, yeah. thinking twice. Gets a Supreme Verdict. All the Sorcery Speed cards, not the most relevant against the end step uh, Restoration Angel. I think Melissa might get this in extra turns. It's definitely possible. Kessick Wolf Run does a very good job of winning games in extra turns. Yeah. <laughs> All you need is one. That is exactly right. Three she, mana for Dave Shields. Shields thinking right now, but yeah. he has to cast the think twice. Yeah. He's thinking again, and there is a just a Steve Vince. Yep, just a Steve Vince. Yeah. And uh, this, ladies and gentlemen, is why Keswick Wolf Run is very, very good in this band deck. Yes, it is. And there is an attack with the Restoration Angel. Probably trying to prompt a attack. block, maybe? Yeah, that's got to be what it is, is trying to get Melissa to get greedy and block it. I mean, and she has to respect Double Searing Spear. I mean, that is a reality that she has to pay attention to. That is true. So it's it's the read, whether or not it's single Searing Spear or double Searing Spear. I'm going to take it. Yeah, and okay. she decides to take it. Wow, that that's amazing. And there it is. Shows it the... <laughs> Restoration Angel, and that's I, I think if I counterflux Restoration Angel, I would have won. 2 1 over Dave but Shields. I was trying to make sure that I killed you before turns. Okay. I thought I was ahead. Yeah. But, I, like, uh, like, if I counterflucked Angel, I can't lose, but, like, I can't, I don't, it's, I can't beat a lot of things either. Yeah, like, I figured it was more likely for you to not have double spear, steering spear and have a way to kill the Angel. That was some exciting magic. That was a dramatic win. A turn five of extra turns uh, right down to the wire, basically playing for top eight, I think. Uh, high stakes match with a lot on the line, and Melissa was able to close it out. Yeah, and actually, I was just I was just looking over mm -hmm. at our fancy dancy Skype chat, and it looks like we got about 20,000 people watching this. Really? 20,000 people. That is we, not a small we, we number. We can get more. Why don't you guys 
Do, go on tell your, your Tweety books. Tell your friends. Go on the Tweety books and the Facey pages and uh, all that stuff. Whatever you kids are doing, and like, get the word out. And let everyone know that we are going into the last round of Swiss. The best standard decks are going to still be in the future match area, and we're going to be showing you. We're going to be talking about it live. That's exactly what we're going to be doing and on I'm, Tweety Books and Facey tweet, page. Tweet, Tweety Books and Facey pages. So just to recap what happened in the feature match area, we just watched the end of the Melissa DeToya versus Dave Shields match, and Melissa DeToya won that 2-1. to one. Tom Martell beat Robert Roberto Gonzalez 2-0, I believe. Joe Larson 2-1 over Stephen Mann. And our first match is Jerry Thompson winning 2-1 over that is exactly Gianluca right. Spanu. So we're going to head back to the news desk, let those guys let you know what happened elsewhere, and then we'll come back to us a little bit later for the last round of Swiss. Wow, what an insane match. We have had some really great stuff down the stretch. We just saw Melissa Del Toro. She won. Tom Martel won his match. And another man also on camera, Jerry Thompson, won his Speaking of Jerry Thompson, we're going to get a deck tech with him and BDM right now. Hi everybody, this is Brian David Marshall coming to you from the Tournament Center at Pro Tour Gate Crash in a rhapsodic convention center as fan favorite after fan favorite is uh, more or less a handshake away from the top eight, including uh, this gentleman right here, Jerry Thompson. We did it. <laughs> we did it. Uh, Jerry, standard, you're working with uh, the Star City team. Channel Fireball. I'm sorry, the Channel Fireball team yeah. for this. Confusing me. You're yeah, dyslexic. I have me. the shirt on. I know. It's so confusing. I, mean, I don't understand. These, these are my boys, but yeah, you're working with the Channel Fireball team for this event. Yeah, you're working with the likes of, you know, Brian Kibler, Paulo Vitor, Dama De Rosa, Luis Scott Vargas. What, what was the, what was the process like? What were you guys thinking about? What was the first deck you guys built? Okay, so it's it's kind of funny actually. So we we went to Las Vegas for a week because that's where Efro lives and he has a pretty big house that we could all stay at. So we tested there for a week and then went to Montreal and I showed up with an Esper deck. I brought some cards to like maybe fill out like some proxy decks or whatever, but I wanted to play this Esper deck. I was I was convinced, right? And I, I played some games against Shuhei, who's who's playing Saito's green red deck, and uh, I did like pretty good. I went like seven three or something. And uh, then Raptors like, how'd you go seven three? Like that doesn't make it any sense. So then he plays four games, goes two and two, and then he's just like, this deck's unplayable. We're not playing Esper. This sucks. And then uh, we we tweak like the the green red deck, and then they build blue white red. To, to beat that deck, and then they decide that Esper beats everything, so then they start playing that. So as I'm coming off of Esper and onto the blue-white red deck, they're going off the blue-white red deck back onto Esper, and it was just, it was kind of comical the way it all happened. And, but, and at the moment, both decks are looking like yeah, they're me, in the top eight of this Me and Ben Stark are, are both looking good, so uh, I, I think both decks are good, you so, know? I just, I really like this deck. I've played it for two months, and I know it, so. So it's a variation on the, the Flash deck. Yeah, I, I top a little less flashy. Yeah, I top eight the Grand Prix with blue white flash. Next weekend, added a color, got tenth in another GP, and then I've just been playing the blue white red one since. But yeah, like you said, more sorcery speed stuff, Mizia Mortars, Boros Reckoner. Well, let's take a look. We'll yeah. put it up on the sure. screen. Deck we've been calling Reckoner Control. Uh, you know, Snapcaster Mage, and you know, still flashy. But Boros Reckoner has been kind of like the the big card this tournament. Yeah. I, I had, well, I had two in one of my draft decks, and it is insane <laughs> in both formats. It's 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 so gross. Like if, if you guys saw like my last match playing for top eights, uh, he just like had to spear it, and I killed his one drop, and he's just like, yeah, I mean, I have to, otherwise I can't ever attack you again. So uh, it's it's just awesome. It's like a good, a decent threat against control, and then it just like stops all the aggro decks, blocks drag to us profitably. Uh, so, so basically, the four cards we have here is like a combo kill, it if is. you would. It is. So I used to play Rune Shanner's Pike to get in like, you know, huge 10-point swings to just close the game out. But now I don't have to play that anymore, which is awesome because I hated that card. <laughs> it was so bad drawing it in your opener against aggressive decks or whatever. Now we have Harvest Pyre, which uh, either deals them 20 or kills like a Thunder Maw Hellkite. Wait, which... wait. How, does, how does Harvest Pyre deal them 20? It says uh, X damage to target creature. Well, uh, thankfully, Thought Scour. Target yourself, uh, and the deck, you know, has Sphinx's Revelation, which I'm sure we'll get to. But you, you end, the games go long, you end up drawing almost your entire deck. So okay. you're gonna have the cards in your graveyard. At some point, you're gonna have Boros Reckoner. You're gonna be able to like Snapcast from the Harvest Pyre if you used it or milled into it or whatever. So 
Uh, it's it's very clean and it, it's like a kill slot that's just removal spells. And in, ca in case you guys aren't following what's going on here, you're taking the harvest pyre and you're yeah. aiming it at your own yep. Boros Reckoner. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure that that should work that way, but it does, and I will take <laughs> advantage of it. Okay, let's take a look at some more some more of the cards you mentioned. A bunch of these cards. Uh, why don't we work right to left here? What, what's okay. going on with the Zori Shrine? That seemed like a, an amazing card for you. Every time I it's, watched you play it, it's unfair. Like you. You would think that like with Vapor Snag and Snapcaster Mage, like every turn you're like bouncing their guy, people got fed up with that. And now it's kind of the same thing with Azorius Charm. You're just like, put that guy on top. Next turn they attack you again. You're like, Snapcaster, put that guy on top. It just buys you a ton of time, allows you to make a lot of land drops, and then we refuel with Sphinx's Revelation, right. which is... But, but going back to the okay. Trump for a second, that, that's more, even better, like a Vapor Snag in a sort of just blank board where you're both like yeah, top decking. It, it, it does nothing. This, this cycles. It, it, for whatever reason, I don't know. It's just like in case it's dead, in case it's not good, just get a new card. It's great. Have you ever have you ever used it for lifelink? Has I, that come up? I used the lifelink a lot more when I had Pike in the deck so that you okay, could gain yeah, those oh, big yeah. swings. But uh, now all my guys have like you know three power or whatever. It's like not that big. It's usually just better to like put their attacker on top sure. unless you're in burn rage and they have no creatures or whatever. And you, like, and you, it comes up. And you don't really need it that much now that you have. Yeah, yeah. Revelation. Once once you get to like six or seven lands, you start firing those off and. Uh, they basically chain into each other or Snapcaster Mages, which allow you to cast more. And it's like, it gets to a point where every other turn you're like casting a Revelation and then killing all their guys and then casting another Revelation. It just spirals out of control. Think twice, just... I, I used to play like two to three, and now that the deck has a lot more sorcerers in it, like Boros Reckoner, it's like your, your early turns are more taken up by casting that guy. And like, uh, I used to have Pillar of Flame, but now all of the creatures are like a lot bigger, a lot better. So I'm playing Searing Spear and, and Mortars. So... Uh, my, my removal is a lot more expensive too. So I want to play one. Drawing one is always good, but drawing two can be slow. And Augur Bowl seems like a card that's great. It blocks against the aggressive creatures, yep. buys you some time, and then just finds you all your great spells. Yeah, if I need a removal spell, if I need to make land drops, get a Thought Scour, whatever. All right, and then let's look. You talked about some of these removal, removal. spells. The Fiery Red. Yeah. Uh, Searing Spear, just premium removal in the format right now? It, it is right now. Uh, I was a pretty big hater of this before because Pillar of Flame basically killed everything I wanted it to. Uh, and now there's like Flint Hoof Boars, lots of Hell Riders. The instant speed's pretty important. Boros Reckoner is obviously I was say, a good Sometimes card you just too. have to wince and spear a Reckoner. Yeah, I mean, that's that's not that bad. I, I learned uh, throughout a couple practice games that like them playing the Reckoner first is like almost always bad because you just spear it and take three. And taking three is not that big of a right, deal. It's like it attack you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whatever. But if, if they play a Reckoner, you just play your own. And then either they trade off or they have to spear it and kill their own guy. So. And then uh, Mizium Orders. Oh, well, we're, this is uh, going to look at the last set of cards here. Uh, Restoration Angel. Okay. Rewind, Counterflux, all sorts. Some of the Flash components of the Flash deck. Yeah, for sure. Like, if, if you're in a, like, draw-go game or whatever, like, Rewind's awesome because it lets you just counter their spell and then play Sphinx's Revelation. And then Counterflux is just, like, good in the Revelation mirrors. They side in a lot of cheap counter spells, like Dispel and stuff. And you really don't want to like cast rewind and get it dispelled and have them resolve this revelation. So counterflux is pretty key. I didn't want to play too many counter spells because the format's pretty fast. And uh, like playing stuff like syncopate is not very good. You know, you, so, you end up with just hands that are very difficult to keep when you don't know. Yeah, exactly. What you're and if, if you're on the draw, like a lot of the times, those counter spells are much worse. But there are revelation mirrors. There are things like Rakdos's return and planeswalkers that Ooh. you need to counter spell. So I do like a couple hard counters. I think this mix is fine. You know, you, you can basically play whatever you want if you expect reanimate or something maybe dissipate is what you should play. But. Okay, Re Restoration Angel, still still, still awesome. good after all this year? Yeah, Angel, uh, it, it kind of like came full circle where like Angel is not that good and now it's back to being good because uh, Tomorrow Saito kept posting like these insane like Flint Hoof Boar decks. And so that's that's why Channel Fireball initially got on Blue White Red was because of this. And they're like, oh, we get to play Reckoner 2, this is perfect. But how, how frustrating was that, having a deck builder of the caliber of Tomohara Saito just like, just it, want, dropping bombs from the sky it was sick. on like, the metagame? It was sick. ended up playing a very similar deck to his like Gyre Sage Naya deck. Uh, his his Green Red deck was almost something that I played just because like Burning Tree Emissary is so good. Uh, but uh, I feel more comfortable with this. But Let, yeah, it was it was crazy. You never know like what's going to happen if Saito's like posting on Twitter. Let's go look at the lands in your deck here. Uh, you know, oh, we, we actually My, had a, a, yeah. a dangling Supreme Verdict. Yeah, just kind of hanging out. Like, it's it's nice to be able to cast Revelation for like four or more and not be drawing dead to their board. So I like having an out, like something that's just like a massive right. reset button. So, right. uh, Hallowed Fountain, Steam Vent, Sacred Foundry, 
go to the next slide, look at some more lands. Uh, Clifftop Retreat, Sulphur Falls, Glacial Fortress, just every permutation you yeah. can of white, red, blue lands. But something that's kind of unusual about your deck is actually on the next slide. And uh, I haven't seen a lot of this in these kind of like control decks. They just max out on duels? Just, I've just seen a ton of decks maxed out on, on dual lands, yeah. uh, all sorts of stuff. You're actually, I mean, you've talked about Ghost Quarter a lot over the, over as long as it's been around. Yeah. The card you obviously have an affinity for. Are you thinking about Ghost Quarter when you're putting these kind basic of, but lands in your deck? I, I also don't want to take a bunch of damage for each of my land drops. Like, I'm only playing 10 of the Ravnica duels, and I think that's probably the right number. Like, my mana was pretty good all day, but as uh, you guys may have seen in my feature match, playing for top eight, in game two, I had to take six to eight damage from my lands because I didn't draw like enough basics, enough okay. core set duels. So uh, there, there's like risk and reward. You have yeah. to balance it out. While you're doing that, let's take a just quick look to the sideboard that we're going to be seeing tomorrow. Jace Memory Adept, Negate, Dispel, Essence Scatter. And then the last slide, take a look at the Oblivion Ring, Planar Cleansing, a, a card that you're just like how to break out this this week. And yeah. Like, oh, I can kill Planeswalkers in the control mirror? Yeah, Domri Rod, Triumph of Ferocity, like their O-ring on your Reckoner, whatever. Get out of here. Graph Digger's Cage and Rock's Faith Mender, another card that had a breakout performance this week. Much like this gentleman here, Jerry Thompson, going into the top eight, you know, assuming meteors don't hit like they did in Russia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, for Jerry Thompson, this is Brian David Marshall signing off from the Tournament Center. To go to the board. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Tournament Center. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe, joined by Brian David Marshall. That was a fun <sighs> deck tech. Yeah, take a deep breath. Things are getting very, very hectic here now. In just a couple of minutes, we're going to have our own Richard Hagen. He's going to break down all of the things that have been happening, <laughs> and we're going to get that. I see him running into the field. Camera here. people, we... you missed Rich Hagen running to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we send it over to him right now to help break down everything that's going on here in Montreal? Now, it's entirely possible that they just lied to you because they probably said I was running. Look at me, I never run. Let's walk on. So, here's the situation. We've had 15 rounds gone, one to come. You are not gonna miss any of the action. We are in a dinner break. I wonder how many of the players on this leaderboard are feeling hungry right now. Not many of them, because there's a lot of tension around. Not for some people though, some people are happy and getting ready to tuck into a celebration because they're coming back for Super Sunday. Let's take a look. Ben Stark and Owen Turtonwald, they took their ID, they sat down, they shook hands, they said, well done my friend, you are in Sunday action. So 12, two and one, they are in. I thought that Melissa Dave Shields match was amazing magic. I love it any time you're gonna get that much land into play and so much going on. Terrific match. Melissa at 12 and 3 probably gets to sit down in the last round, shake someone's hand and say, thank you very much. I will see you tomorrow. Now, who else is in that position? Joel Larson of Sweden. He defeated Stephen Mann, dropping him to 11 and 4. Joel Larson, 12 and 3. 6 and 0, oh, then 6 2, and now 12 and 3. Looks like he will be able to ID into the top eight. Jerry Thompson, the roof was raised here in Montreal. Jerry Thompson, Brian David Marshall called it in his column at the start of the weekend. The pro with nearly 200 lifetime pro points, and now here he is making it in to his first Pro Tour top eight. Congratulations to him. Couple of Grand Prix wins already, but now the Pro Tour title is in the sights of Jerry T. Let's move on. Take you to the other side. Three is the magic number we're looking for. And that means Tom Martell of the United States. He won Grand Prix Indianapolis. That was Legacy. Maybe it was even modern. I think it was Legacy last year. Nearly won the second Indianapolis Grand Prix of 2012. Here he is in another Pro Tour Top 8. Now, how about this for a fact? Tom Martell walked up to Ben Stark just before the last round but one and was going, streak, streak, streak. And I'm like, I know about streaks on the Pro Tour. What are these people talking about? Turns out that every time Ben Stark is in top eight, Tom Martell 
gets to the top eight, gets knocked out by Ben Stark in the quarterfinals. Tom Martel said, if you want to put me in the quarterfinals and I lose to Ben Stark, I'll take that right now. Well, who knows who he might play tomorrow, but at 12 and three, Tom Martel of the United States, we think he may well be in with one round to go. Now, back we go to this side. Let's start looking at the 11 and fours. This is where it gets very, very tricksy. Gianluca Spano of Italy, he's 11 and four. He has just had his first loss in constructed play. So he now will need to play, get to 12 and four, hope for tie breaks. His tie breaks are pretty good. He has a chance. Down here, Roberto Gonzalez, 11 and four, needs a win. Ditto, Stephen Mann. On this side, you've got Dave Shields, who just lost out to Melissa in that last round. Now Shields will join the tie-break tombola, if you will. Who has the best breakers? Whose opponents, who are still playing in the last round, could make just that half a percentage point difference to see you in or out of the top eight shakeabout? Eric Froelich. Now, we suspect, because he's been riding so high in the standings, remember, he began with a buy in round one. He was on a table of seven for drafting. He was the odd man out at that table of seven. So partly from that, but then through all his opponents through the next 14 rounds, he's been riding very high in the standings, which means that his 11 and four is worth a little more than some of the other 11 and fours. Like for example, Conley Woods and John Stern, you see down here from Canada, 11 and four. Their tie breaks are not as good as someone like Eric Froelich. We suspect that a win for Eric Froelich may yet see him getting into the top eight despite some killer matchups. He's played Ben Stark twice already this tournament. He would love a chance for the rubber match on Sunday in the top eight. Isaac Egan of Australia, 11 and four, still in the hunt. Shahar Shenhar, now he's 11 and four, but I've got to tell you, he's been riding up the standings rather than bubbling around the top of them. And what that means again is that Shahar may fall just fractions of a percentage short, even if he wins his last round. But then draws, as we've seen, can really change everything. It's not just up here that the draws matter. Further down the field, the draws can lead to pairings misaligned. We don't have the pairings yet for the final round. When we see them, we'll be able to break down at the desk for you who will sit down and walk off into the sunset together, looking forward to Sunday, and all these 11 fours going head to head for one round of magic for a shot at Super Sunday. Let's head back to the booth to Marshall to Brian David Marshall and a man who doesn't need to do any tie-break maths because he's beaten enough people he doesn't need to care. Here comes Ben Stark. Hey everybody, welcome back. Marshall Sutcliffe, BDM, and we have Ben Stark with us. Ben, congratulations. It looks like you're uh, going to pick up your fourth Pro Tour Top 8 here this weekend. Thanks. Can you walk us through uh, the early stages, just round, not round by round, but like did you 3 out your first draft and then go 5-0? How did sure, it go yeah. for you? Leg by leg. Yeah, leg sure. Leg by leg. I mean, the tournament started off with them filming my draft because uh, I was at the feature pod. Uh, it was a really tough pod. It had Reed Duke, Godinus Fitter, I can't say his last name, um, <laughs> Chapin, uh, Andreas, uh, Olivier, Ruel, and like a couple of people I didn't really recognize. Although people who actually ended up doing quite well, one of, the, uh, one of them was, I believe, uh, the Australian Dutch guy or something. And, and, we call uh, him DVR Yeah, because yeah. none of us can say his name. <laughs> yeah, but he was like deep in the tournament playing for top, and I think he fin he's about X5 now or something, mm -hmm. but you know. So it was a really tough pod. I drafted Simic. Um, I, uh, I went 2-1. I beat uh, Reed and Godennis, and I, I lost to a guy I didn't recognize. Then, uh, and I feel really good about this draft format. Like, if this was a draft pro tour, like a draft top eight, I would love my chances. You yeah, know? you're well known for being a limited specialist, and it sounds like you've got gate crash pretty Yeah, nailed. I mean, some of them are, you know, obviously I'm always going to do well or, you know, have a shot to do well. I mean, it's still magic, but in limited. But in this one in particular, a lot of people were drafting it very badly, I felt like. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I felt like I had a lot more free wins. Like, it's really, like, it's almost like Zendikar is very fast. Can, can we say that they were not as prepared as you were <laughs> for this draft format? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm lucky. I'm really lucky to be a part of a big team where, uh, while well, they're building an insane constructed deck, I'm doing, like, Moto 8 fours and stuff, figuring out the best way to draft the format for us, you know? So I'm very fortunate there. I think they're also fortunate to have you doing that. Let's not yeah. forget that. <laughs> yeah, it, sure, it's a good team effort. But so I wasn't that confident going into the constructed, is what I'm saying. 
Uh-huh. Uh, I was excited to play Asper. I played Blue Black Control in Type 2, and then I played Blue White Control to Top 16 in GP in Type 2. So I was happy to play a Control deck with Drown Yards. Mm -hmm. But I really didn't know how good Esper was. Uh -huh. But it ran great for me. I, I only picked up one loss, and that was to Efro, who had some good sideboard cards against me. And uh, I mean, I only lost, I think, three games in the uh, eight wow. rounds of standard I even played. I, I, I'm not 100%, it might be four or something, but it was, uh -huh. you know, the games really, all, all the matchups felt smooth, the deck ran super smooth, you know, a lot of lands and think twice, all that. And anyways, for the tournament, I basically just ran good the whole time. I mean, after the 2-1, I 5-0'd the standard, taking me to my second draft today, or the second draft in the tournament, first draft today, where I drafted Orzov, which is my preferred guild. I'll draft any of them, they're all good, but Orzov is the best in my opinion. And you have a, a, a specific take on Orzov. You think yeah. it should be drafted with cheap spells. Yeah, well, Extort lends itself so well to cheap spells. Like, people keep acting like it's a control deck. Since when does drain life in your opponent and attacking with little flyers and playing all cheap spells be a control deck? Yeah, it doesn't I mean, play like that. You could call it whatever you want. I'm not here to define control deck. But what you're looking for in Orzov is cheap evasion creatures, extort creatures, cheap tricks that you can extort them when you play. So it ends up like being very tough to beat that. Yep. In my, how many Orzhov rares would you take over Basilica Screecher or a King Pit's pet? The pet's a lot better than the Screecher, obviously. obviously. I mean, um, I mean the, the Ghost Council is one of the best rares in the set. I mean, that thing is nigh unbeatable. Um, a lot of the six mana ones, I'm not going to lie, like I've d I did like 20 drafts. I haven't had them multiple times or anything, so it's pretty hard for me to evaluate something like the six mana 4 4 flying angel that gives like your guy's lifelink and stuff. That guy's pretty good. Like yeah, pretty good. You know, that guy's a nice card. Yeah. But it's hard to compare that to a kingpin pet yet because, you know, it's six mana instead of three, but it's, it's powerful. You know, I can't be sure. Sure. But the more expensive cards have been performing worse and worse for me, like in my testing. Like I've, I've been realizing that like pet is just better. Like you just you just want pet and Syndic of Tides and Smite and all these cheap guys, cheap cheap tricks, et cetera, et cetera. Now how did that so draft good. deck do for you in your second pod? I 3 0 um, I got a little lucky, like I had a good deck, probably the second or third best deck in our pod. But I played against the the, the Australian Dutch guy I was telling you about, and he GBR. yeah, his deck was not the best in the field. There, we he was splashing for like uh, oh. Towering Thunder Fist. Is that the deck you're talking? No, about? no, no, no. Wait. Maybe I'm confusing two people, or you are. I'm not sure. I, I must yeah, be. You yeah. are, you in are. round three, I played the guy I'm talking about, and he had he a had the Boros deck. Yeah. It was incredible. Oh, that we yeah. had that on camera. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he had multiple copies of Guild Mage and Mugging. I think he had three Guild Mage. I think it was yeah, three. Yeah. Was sweet. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know how many Mugs he had. At least two. It might have been three. He I had two know. Muggings. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I didn't see his whole deck, but I was in the draft and I watched in the matches. Yeah. Whatever. But his deck, his deck was incredible. I mean, I, I would take his deck against mine all day. Uh huh. You know, I just got a little lucky game two. He got mana screwed. I mean, game three, he actually had a fine draw, but I was two drop, three drop, four drop. And then after we were about even, he drew all land and I kept drawing action. And I, I was able to take the game. All right, so you 3 0 that pod, and then you came into that final stretch, which is, of course, really important in the run up to the top eight. Right. So I was happy to get that one because now I'm X1, so I have a few matches to give in the standard where I'm not nearly as confident. I start off by playing Efro. Um, he beat me 2 1, uh, my only loss in standard. Uh, I mean, game one, uh, we had a really close game, but uh, I felt kind of in control. Game two and three, uh, his sideboard cards were really tough for me. Uh, the Triumph of Ferocity and Boros Charm, you know, uh, they really put off the Wrath deck. And then, because first he forces me to act by drawing two cards a turn. Uh -huh. I can beat that, but I have to react to it. Now while I'm reacting to it, he gets to hit me with these haste, haste creatures and then Boros Charm my, ra my Wraths. Mm -hmm. It really felt very tough after board. Yeah, that's brutal. So you pick up your first loss uh, in Constructed there. Right. Then what happened? Then I played Top Martell, who, uh, I, as uh, Hagen was mentioning earlier, uh, so <laughs> I've won one Grand Prix, one Pro Tour. I played him in the Swiss of both of those, and then in the quarters of both of those. And I've beaten him every time. I'm now 6 0 against him. Okay. Hey, everybody's got their nemesis. I mean, Kibler's like 6 0 against me or whatever, you know? <laughs> and, and to Kibler's credit, I played him mostly in limited, not even in constructed. Like, uh -huh. he just keeps beating me, you know? It, just, it is what it is. He's a great player, you know? But so I beat Tom, and. Uh, you know, it's not like we've tested against their deck. I mean, it was kind of a Star City Brew, you know, like we didn't, you know, we didn't test against something like that. But the matchup feels good to me. I mean, White Weenie doesn't do well against our deck. Uh -huh. We have cheap enough tricks to get us to Wrath, to get us to Revelation. They've got some things that are a pain in the neck, like Aristocat and Ghost Council, but it's not limited. Like, I can, you know, you can beat a Ghost Council. You can Azorius Charm it, you can Edict it, you can Wrath, you know, you, I mean, obviously they can blink it out, but if, it's, if they're blinking it out, it's only two a turn, you can Revelation. Yeah. You know, I mean, even if you have to hit them with, for five and Azorius Charm, that's three turns of them blinking that in and out, and then you can just Revelation for seven or whatever, right. you know what I mean? I feel like those guys are very smart and they have plans and they, their deck always has game, but I, that's a matchup I'm, I, I would like to play. Like, I, I feel like, you know, I feel like we can take that deck. Yeah. And I did beat Tom 2 well, although he had, a, he had a good draw in game one, but he had a bad draw in game two. In game two, he mulled the five and then didn't really see anything. Uh -huh. So then after that, um, 
who did I play in the, after I played Tom? Uh, Melissa, right? Because only three rounds, yeah. So then I played Melissa, same situation. I mean, she's a good player. She's an incredible run in the top eight here now, I'm sure. And uh, she has a good deck for the field, but it's not a good deck against Esper. It's like, you know, three quarters control, and our deck is all the way control, you know? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, like, it's really hard to beat someone down with centaur healers, you know? I mean, right. I'm playing rats and Azorius, Charms and Edicts and all that stuff. Wolfram's a threat, but it's not going to work most of the time, you know? Uh -huh. So you were able to beat her, and that put you in position to draw it. And that left me and Owen as the only X2s in the tournament, so then we just drew with each other, and that brings us to where we are right now. Congratulations, that's a great run. Thanks. Let me ask you a question about the Esper deck. We, were talking, we just had Jerry in here mm -hmm. talking about the, the blue-white-red deck. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like there was a little bit of like a shell game going around yeah. on the team yeah. with, with decks. Were you, were you ever on the blue-white-red yes. deck? Yes, yes. I actually believe the blue-white-red deck, like in and of itself, not necessarily for this tournament, but in and of itself, is a better deck than the Esper deck. Um, what basically happened was we were testing. Uh, we, we were testing Esper, it was okay. We were testing Blue White Red, it was doing a little better than Esper. But then we kind of realized that Blue White Red was getting crushed by Esper. So we were still going to play Blue White Red because we're not out to beat our own test deck. Right. But then we started seeing the Blue White Red list showing up in the Moto Dailies, 4 0 and, and all of that. And, and we realized like everybody knew about Blue White Red, that it wasn't our tech. And then we were like, well, if Blue White Red is going to be one of the major players in the field, it's going to be better to play the deck that's only just slightly worse but wins the mirror, so to speak. You know? And I'm still scared of Blue White Red. I, I beat it once in this tournament against a Shi Tian Li, I think his name sure. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Top but, uh, of the last part. But like, for example, Jerry is a fantastic player and a great control player. So I mean like I'm not that's not the kind of matchup like where I'd be that confident like I would against like say Tom in, in the top eight. But I mean we're a favorite. Like I, I'm sure he would say he would rather be on the Esper side than the Blue White Red side head to head, you know? So there was a little bit of that shell game. It was like, you know, we like our blue white red deck a lot. We like Esper a lot too, but not quite as much. But now that like everybody, it seemed, got on blue white red that was popping up on Moto so much and everything, we wanted to have another good matchup. We wanted to play Esper so right. we could call blue white red a good matchup instead of just playing mirrors with blue white red. Sure. Mm -hmm. So you so, said, so the end result is you guys put two decks into the top eight. Maybe three. Maybe three. Yeah, Efro is X and four with the best breakers in the tournament. So and, if he wins, and three his match, different, and that would be eight. three different archetypes because he's yeah. playing something radically different he's, from yeah, both of these. He's way off. <laughs> yeah. Well, ironically, no shell game there. Um, <laughs> Efro the whole time really loved Saito's mono red beatdown with the Flintoff fours and rainbow. Yeah, four. yeah. And then as other people started to catch on to that, and we realized that deck was like everyone's playing it. Uh, Fro worked on it pretty much the whole time. He put a lot of effort into it when other people really weren't. And then he just tuned the list a little bit to get the version he has now. Which even though it's three colors, it really plays basically like that red-green beatdown deck, not like more of a mid-range Naya. So he put a lot of hard work in his deck, and I, I hope he makes top eight. I mean, I don't love the matchup, and I, I hope I don't play him in the top eight or anywhere. <laughs> but uh, you know, I hope he wins because you know he deserves it. So you're you're, you're what we refer to as a pro tour veteran. <laughs> been around uh, a while. You've been doing it around for a while. You're you're uh, eligible for the Hall of Fame uh, again this year. But just looking at some of the younger players who are coming into this top eight, or mm -hmm. you know, who, who look to be in a position. I, I know I know uh, Owen has switched teams, but you've you spent a lot of time with him on the pro tour over the last sure. few years. Ha how good do you feel for, for the likes of Owen and Jerry Thompson? Someone like Melissa, yeah. who's actually been around almost as long as you have. Yeah, I couldn't be happier for them. I mean, I remember what it was like to get my first top eight. I wasn't one of those people that top eight in my first Pro Tour. Like, you know, it was my 10th, 12th Pro Tour, something like that. And I had lots of money finishes, you know? So I, I know for guys like Owen, for Jerry, for Melissa who put in their dues and, uh, you know, I know how it feels. It feels great. You know, it's, it's a monkey off your back. It's everything you've worked for. I mean, other tournaments are sweet, of course, but there's a lot of Grand Prix. you know. I mean, they're still sweet, but there's a lot of them. Pro Tours, you know, it's the big stage. It's what everybody's dreaming about when you're a kid playing Magic. Yeah, well, awesome. All right. So we're going to see, we're going to get to see some bonus Magic from Ben this weekend and yeah. from a few of his friends. And then we have two more people that we need to find out who's gonna, who are going to be in there. And I think we're going to send it to the booth. Uh, no, we're, we're actually no? going to have a couple of people come in here oh, I for see. some interviews very soon. So, oh, Ben, gonna, thanks a lot. Right. Congratulations thanks, again. Guys. And we Appreciate will see it. you tomorrow yes, sir. on Sunday. All right. All right. Maybe that's the right that's one. I like, I like your Yo, question we'll about the shell it. game. Because yeah. it did sound like okay. that. We've heard it from multiple ben. different sources about how they're like, well, we'll do that because that beats that. And then everybody jumps to the next one. It's kind of like this one-upsmanship. And then everybody just kind of landed, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, every, and, and you know, and, and it's comfort level, right? For, uh, for for Jerry, he's been playing that blue, white, red deck. He knows that thing for inside ages. Inside and out. Right? And you can watch him playing it, right? You watch it. We, you know, it's so funny. Like, it, it's so hard not to root for Jerry here. I know. Right? I, you know, we're, we're, I know. Objective journalism window threw it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, 
you really, really root for him. Like, he's 190 lifetime print points coming into this. You really want to see him get that top eight. That's right. And you know, we have this huge plasma monitor back here that you know, uh, you know, we we keep, could do to watch the thing. And and Marshall and I are just like two kids. We're staring. Like, those are just like you know, in front, like three inches from the TV, just like, is he gonna do it? Is he going to do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a great experience. And there was also a big outburst. You know, you can hear it from the viewing area and stuff, too. So there's definitely this tangible feel for me. Yeah, we, we also had that same reaction while we were waiting to do Jerry's deck tech as we were watching the last match of this of this round. Which was which an incredible an match. An incredible match. And we were all rapt attention watching Melissa DeTora, uh, yeah, someone I, I've seen Shields, playing Magic yeah. for, for uh, as, uh, probably as long as you've been playing Magic. <laughs> on the East Coast and, and onto the Grand Prix circuit and onto the Pro Tours and, and now uh, onto Sunday. So, yeah. Melissa DeTora, thanks for joining us at the news desk. Hey, welcome to the booth and congratulations. <laughs> what was going on in that last game? That was crazy. Yeah, it was a really crazy game. It was really intense, like definitely the hardest match I've played all weekend. So what did it come down to at the end? I was trying to watch it, but then also, you know, I have to get prepared to be in here. Can you can you talk to us about what the, the key components were on the last few turns? I know there was a lot of people watching that match, and it was really intense. Well, his life total was really low, and I had uh, Angel in play, and I really needed a Kessa Wolf run, which I did not have. Ah. And he jokingly said to me, oh, do you have the Wolf run? And I was like, yeah, maybe. And I drew a card, it was Wolf Run, so, oh. <laughs> I, drew, I mean, I've drawn so many cards that game, so like, yeah. it was like basically like the biggest top deck ever, so I played it, um, attacked him for lethal, he had an answer, um, and then on the following turn, I did it again, and he didn't have the answer, it was like really close. And that was it. And, and then at, at the end of that, you guys we were at the table, and it was kind of like, like, we could see like you guys kind of explaining stuff, and Dave Shields was, was going through stuff with you. What, what were you guys talking about at the end of that, at the end of that game? Uh, we were just talking about like the whole game three, uh, like stuff we could have done differently because it was just like every decision mattered, every draw set mattered. Yeah, it seems like that you guys were both uh, playing the type of deck that put a lot of pressure on each decision. And uh, we know Dave's a, a very good player as well. So what, what goes through your mind at that moment? Like oh. what, what, do you, what do you, what do you, what's the first thought that pops into your mind as soon as he like extends the hand and uh, you're gonna sign that slip? Well, first I was like, really? You don't have, you don't have the answer? And then he was like, no, like I'm really happy for you. You know, we've been uh, playing Magic together for a long time. And he was like, you know, I've, I'm really glad that it was you that I lost to. And I was like, wow, like, is that it? Did, is, did I really make top eight? But. Once I uh, draw in and actually do it, then I'll actually believe it. Okay, so, you, so you're still holding a little something in reserve here because you want to see this this last round? Yeah, I'll, when I see it, I'll believe it. <laughs> I've done the knife plenty of times before. Okay. All right, well, we have confidence that you're going to be playing tomorrow, and we know that there's a lot of people out there waiting to see. So we wanted to say congratulations. We're going to let you go to celebrate. If and nothing go else, congratulations on an amazing match. Thanks. Yeah, All fantastic. Right, well. Yep. All right, thanks a lot, thanks. Melissa. And let's just me and you talk now, BDM. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been winding things down. The pairings are going to be up soon. And uh, this has been one of the most intense mad dashes. And we have a man by the name of Richard Hagen who seems to be coming into the Mad the, Dash Hagen, there. as we like to call him. <laughs> I think that was a strict downgrade from Melissa de Tora. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, but Melissa, uh, to me, uh, she's got more magic to not play or being well. She, she said, uh, hopefully. I, I thought it was very interesting. She's like, She's like, yeah, yeah, ease up on those congratulations, fellas, until I actually sign that slip. Well, the line isn't crossed yet. Yeah? Yeah. But, all things being equal, this is how things look. There are six players who are on 36 points or better coming into this last round. All right? So by our reckoning, those, and they have been paired up against each other. So there will be three IDs, all things being equal. So at that point, you have six players into the top eight that point it becomes a little bit complicated but not actually as complicated as all that we are putting four matches on camera all of whom are sitting at 11 and 4 but all 11 and 4s were not created equal by the good lord or whoever else might have invented sure. 11 and 4 so it looks like this Eric Froelich is up against uh, Spanu of Italy because they have been so high in the standings it looks almost certain that the winner there is in. Both of both us have extremely high tie They're breakers. right up at the top, because Eric Froelich was 7-1 overnight, yeah. and so pretty much Froelich wins, he's in, Spanu wins, pretty much sure, 
that'll be number seven. Number eight is more complicated. Uh, you have Isaac Egan of Australia up against Roberto Gonzalez. Now, if Egan wins, there's a very good chance that that's enough. If Gonzalez wins, that potentially opens the door to Stephen Mann. Stephen Mann is playing Shahar Shenhar. Now you might think, okay, so what about if Shahar wins and goes to 12-4? Well, he doesn't have quite as good a percentage as either Mann or Egan. So Shahar needs quite a lot to go his way. His own match to win and two or three tie breaks to hold up. We have one more feature match to show you that is John Stern of Canada against Conley Woods. But realistically, because they are down at table eight and they're tiebreak, they've been working their way up the standings. You know this, Brian, doesn't generally I, work out I just out want from to there. offer a small wrinkle to this scenario. Wrinkle away. Conley Woods and Eric Froelich are teammates and good friends with both Ben Stark and Owen Turtenwald. It is not inconceivable that in an effort to get maybe two more 11 and fours, uh, I'm sorry, 12 and fours into the top eight, or one more 12 and four into the top eight, that both of them, who have a loss to give, they can throw a loss out the window. It is not out of the question that Ben Stark and or Owen Turtenwald could choose to play this round. Not often I'm lost for words, is it? <laughs> Get out the abacus. Time to do some new math. It's also the first time yes. I've ever seen that. So, uh, <laughs> right, yeah, uh, yeah, that's, um, yeah. Uh, incidentally. So, I'm just, what, it, what it means yeah. for you at home is that more of these four matches could be, could be in play. And we'll, yeah. we'll know pretty quickly whether or not yes. how, how deep the slots might go. There is one other match that we just couldn't squeeze in into the feature match area. And so congratulations. We all know about uh, Bachera, uh, who's been in and around the top end, and then also Emmanuel Suter. They are playing on table seven. But boys and girls, we're ready for showtime. Let's go. Marshall Sutcliffe, Brian David Marshall, hold on boys. It's time for round 16 of Proto Gate Crash 2013. <laughs> oh.